Okay, Jennifer, we'll go one more minute and then we'll pick you up, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Bowen. Cheers, <laughs> Jennifer. Welcome. Thank you. Masi Cho, Adante Jennifer Bowen, CA. Sambuke Gutsi Ati. Good afternoon. Gunachish to the organizers of sharing our knowledge for accepting my application to present here today. I am a Denny graduate student of art history at the University of Victoria. I was born in Yellowknife Northwest Territories and raised by my Scottish Canadian father, John Bowen. My mother was Christine Draggies of Enoda, also known as Trout Rock on the North Shore of the Great Slave Lake. Her parents were Henry and Elizabeth Draggies, who moved from Enoda to Detta in the 1960s. My grandparents both passed away from tuberculosis in the early 1970s, shortly after I was born. My grandfather, Henry, was the son of Joseph Draggies, a signatory of Treaty 8 in 1928, and he was the son of Old Man Draggies, a chief who signed Treaty 8 in the 1900s in Fort Resolution for the El Knights Dene. For my land acknowledgement, I'd like to acknowledge the lands of the Coast Salish people where I currently work and live in Victoria, BC, and the lands of the Clinket people of Wrangell, Alaska, past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships to the land. I would also like to name my oral history mentor, Chief Fred Sangries of Denende, and my academic mentor, Dr. Upchis Van Campen in the Yukon. Both mentors have encouraged my interest in Northern Athabascan research and exploring the long ago history of my community. My academic interest in the Northern Athabascan dagger began long before my time at the University of Victoria. My interest began in the late 1990s when I worked with the Welladay Elders Advisory Council. The Elders Council organized land-based events to encourage young people to learn our traditional trails. I participated in two community canoe trips, one in 1996 from Welladay to McKay Lake, where the diamond mines are now located in the heart of our traditional territory. Territory. The other trip we did was from Detta to Fort Resolution across the Great Slave Lake. We retraced the crossing my grandfathers took in the 1900s to sign Treaty 8 with Canada. After a couple of days of paddling, when we reached the southern shore of the Great Slave Lake in our Voyager canoes, Peter Tuseta jumped out of our canoe onto the untouched beach where he carved an image of us paddling on the blade of a knife with the edge of his paddle. It was at this moment that I saw the dagger for the first time, even though 
It is the symbol on our band logo and in the name of our people. It took Peter's quiet performance on the land to bring the dagger to life for me. I began asking people in our community about the knife and our use of copper. Most people generally knew we had a copper history, but no one knew exactly how we worked with copper or recalled what our knife looked like. So I began this research project that led me to the university where I began piecing together the complex links and connections of our copper history. My master's research project looked at the academic and exhibition history of Northern Athabascan people and their daggers. The daggers located in museum collections are primarily made with trade metals like steel or iron or sometimes copper sourced from the hulls of wooden ships. The daggers in museum collections are from the early contact period with European explorers and fur traders who distributed the daggers throughout Europe. But there are some examples Examples of daggers in Japanese and Russian collections. While there are many types of knives and daggers collected from Indigenous people across North America, I focused on daggers identified as Northern Athabascan in museum collections and records. I also looked at how Northern Athabascan daggers were first exhibited and written about in Canadian museums. The Northern Athabascan tribes are loosely are a loosely connected group of Indigenous people in Canada and the United States connected linguistically. The geography of the Northern Athabascan tribes is quite expansive. However, their population is surprisingly sparse in comparison. They occupy the subarctic regions of Western Canada and Alaska, and they also extend along the Rocky Mountains and down to the Pacific coast into California. The Northern Athabascans are connected to the Navajo and Apache tribes of the Southwest. They are known linguistically as Southern Athabascan. The Southern Athabascan groups are known for making flint knives, but my research did not find any significant connection to copper. They are best known for their rich history of silver metal jewelry, pottery, and tapestry. I only briefly mention them here to acknowledge the connection between the two groups that contribute to the theories of migration that connect all Athabascan groups. There are 26 nations within the Northern Athabascan linguistic region, which I believe all have a unique and distinct relationship to copper and knives. The academic debate about Northern Athabascan metallurgy is centered on whether the people developed the technology before European contact. In a report published in 1992 titled Aspects of Early North American Metallurgy from the British Museum, the researchers tested clinket, dene, and Inuit metal objects acquired from Indigenous people fabricated before contact. Some of the pieces were thought to be made before European contact and others during contact period. They tested 30 pieces, including four Athabascan style daggers. The test revealed that most of these daggers were made from trade steel. The copper pieces tested from the coastal communities turned out to be smelted copper from refabricated trade items. The authors suggested that items made of smelted copper or iron objects found in the north before contact were likely brought in from trade networks that extended across the Bering Straits or from shipwrecks or driftwood carried by cross currents, cross Pacific currents. The test did not reveal any discovery other than confirming all metal pieces tested had a relationship with European trade. How Northern Athabascan people worked with metal before contact is not exactly known to scholars. However, early uses of metal technology are known. The first step in transforming raw copper is controlled heat. One of the oldest known techniques to separate metal from its impurities is called smelting. However, metal smithing techniques used by Northern Athabascan tribes and other Indigenous groups in North America are suggested to be cold hammering. Cold hammering uses less heat than smelting, which allows the maker to shape soft metals like native copper, which is almost 99% pure. The process require, requires annealing to keep the copper from becoming brittle and breaking in the process. Hammering gives shape to the metal. It also drives out more impurities, but it also weakens its crystalline structure. To prevent breaking, the copper is reheated to return to its crystalline structure, which makes the copper softer and less brittle. Annealing allows the maker to reshape. Oh. 
there is no archaeological evidence that Northern Athabascan people smelted copper. Scholars believe that smelted items that found their way into the region came in as useful trade objects from eastern Russia. In the far east regions of Siberia, there are natural sources of tin and copper and archaeological sites of smelting bronze that date back thousands of years. There are approximately 30 daggers and knives identified in museum collections in Canada and an additional 50 in museums worldwide. It is likely there are more not knives in private collections that are not identified because collecting practices of the period did not include accurate records about who, where, or how the daggers were made. This is a Northern Athabascan copper dagger from the Canadian Museum of History collection. It is dated between the 1700s and 1906. The dagger was collected from Dawson City and possibly made or traded by the local Indigenous people, the Trondic Lichin. Edward Rogers, a curator at the Royal Ontario Museum, in 1965 classified Northern Athabascan daggers based on six distinctive features. He recorded his observations on seven daggers from the National Museum of Canada and the Royal Ontario Museum. The features are, one, the proximal end is Y-shaped with ends of the Y rolled in spirals. The cross section of the blade is flat on one face and has three beveled facets on the other. Three, the edges of the blade are sharpened only on, one, on the face of the blade, which has the beveled facets. Four, the points of the blades are subconical. Five, the lengths vary greatly between 28 and 48 centimeters. And six, the blades are made either of copper or of iron and steel with hilts either wrapped or unwrapped with a hide cloth or vegetable fiber. Roger, Roger's classification has helped identify Northern Athabascan knives and daggers in museum collections, but it also adds to the complexity of the shape of the daggers. There are a lot more single pommel dag daggers in collections not identified as Athabascan because of this description. This leaves, leaves a larger group of daggers unknown in collections in Canada and internationally. Sources of native copper in North America vary from location to location. Corey Cooper identifies the main source of native copper as basaltic lava. Basalt is a fine grain extrusive igneous rock formed from the rapid cooling of low viscosity lava. Native copper was mined at the Copper River and White River that flow over the Alaskan and Yukon borders. Copper was typically collected in nugget form or dendritic mass resembling a tree, but in some cases the copper was so large it was impossible to move. Outside the McBride Museum in Whitehorse, Yukon is an example of a large slab of copper weighing over 2,500 pounds. The copper was found in the White River approximately 250 kilometers west of Whitehorse. The volcanic rock theory also connects the migration stories related to the dispersal of Athabascan tribes centuries ago. Even though the provenance details were overlooked in collections, the knives and copper use were written about in almost all the early explorer journals. There are also watercolors and sketches of the dagger among a number of indigenous people in the interior subarctic and along the coast. The earliest records of the Yale Knives Dene come from a Hudson Bay explorer, Samuel Hearn, in 1772. His journal records not only his treks in search of the Northwest Passage, but also his observations with his Dene guides. His journal notes his admiration of the skill the Dene had for identifying sources of copper just beneath the surface of the tundra. He writes, the Indians dig wherever they observe the pre night lying on the soil, experience having taught them that the largest pieces of copper are found associated with it. Prenite is a crystal that is yellow green or apple green in color. It is commonly associated with copper. The Dene and Inuit traveled regularly to the Coppermine River to mine copper. The social relationships between the Dene and the Inuit were fraught with hostilities and conflict. 
In Hearn's journal, he records that his Dennis Looney guide, Matonabee, unexpectedly murdered a group of Inuit on the shores of the Coppermine River. The dramatic and vivid description of the assault became known as Bloody Falls. As noted in Hearn's journal, however, oral history records of the Inuit in Kugluktuk suggest the story has been over-dramatized by Canadian historians. In Emile Cameron's book, Far Off Metal River, Inuit Land, Settler Stories, and the Making of the Contemporary Arctic, she argues that Canadian historians have used this story and others like it to legitimize European exploration and their presence in the North. Cameron debunks or shifts the geographic narrative of histories of imperialism and colonialism captured in Bloody Falls to an occurrence of copper conflicts between Dene and Inuit. The first exhibition to feature and showcase Northern Athabascan material culture was a partner exhibit between the Royal Scottish Museum and the National Museum of Man in Canada. The exhibition title is Athabascans, Strangers of the North. The exhibition featured over 300 items collected primarily by traders from the Hudson Bay Company. This exhibition catalog, published in 1974, introduced the Northern Athabascan people to the world. The story of the prehistory of the Strangers of the North begins with small tool technology made from obsidian microblades, notched stone sinkers, bone barbs, antler fish hooks, and copper arrow points. The exhibition the exhibition does have a photograph of an iron dagger, but it does not comment on it. It is shown here with a tanned caribou skin knife sheath decorated with black beads and dentalias. The dagger is an accessory to be featured with the knife sheath, present but not named in the catalog. The catalog does feature two knives from Dene makers collected in 1922 and 1911. This is a hunting knife collected by Dorsey Arden that has similar features to the contact period dagger found in museum collections today. However, I think it looks closer to a recent discovery in the Alpine ice patches. As a result of climate change, the discovery of copper endpoint was found in the melting Alpine ice patches along the Alaska and Yukon borders on the north slope of the St. Elias mountain range. In an article in the Journal of Glacial Archaeology, researchers found what they named JBUW-21-1, a copper end point end blade secured by bibiche and sinew lashed on a barbed hunting arrow made of caribou antler. The cold climate of the Alpine ice patches help preserve the organic materials. The end blade was found in the traditional territory of the Car Cross Tagish First Nation and the Kwanlin Dun First Nation. When the researchers tested the copper, they found the piece, the copper piece was 97.8% pure. The radiocarbon dating of the end blade dates it to over 936 years old, with approximately 22 years plus or negative. The end point looks very similar to the dagger, except the end point has a single center bevel versus the two in the contact period daggers. End blades also have two tempered edges like the dagger. These discoveries are exciting and prove that Indigenous people in the North have, had, have worked with metal for a very long time. The Athabascan people and the tribes along the Pacific coast had very different ways of working and living with copper, which is reflected in their cultural differences. Athabascan people in the eastern interior subarctic were highly nomadic and moved regularly, carrying everything with them. The mobile nature of the Athabascan people produced a pragmatic aesthetic style where the copper was shaped and reshaped as needed. The history of the dagger is woven in multiple connections and disconnections throughout history. It has a complex history to tell from 26 separate nations of Northern Athabascan peoples, each with a unique history and relationship with copper and daggers. Today, Indigenous people are beginning to reconnect with their historic connection to copper through contemporary artistic expressions that include refabricating daggers. The melting ice patches in the Yukon may connect us further to understanding the technology used by our long ago people. Indigenous people's relationships with the dagger is outside the concepts of an 
atemporal container of written histories, events, movements, and timeframes used by the settler colonial state. Indigenous peoples' knowledge systems are complex and woven together with oral history, story, dance, and visual arts as forms of self-identity, but also as, form, as a form of self-government. Thank you. So I was told I had 20 minutes, <laughs> 25 minutes. So I went really quickly through my presentation. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I might be able to ask, a, respond to a question if you have any. Questions in the room? Um, I could start us off with a question. Um, Jennifer, do you have a sense of, um, that's it was such an amazing and fascinating presentation and the images are so beautiful and I was just thinking about um, movement of metal across the continent and whether you have, your research has uncovered um, and I think of uh, Slinget stories in which, you know, uh, a piece of copper coming from the interior, you know, becomes something very important to a clan and I'm just wondering, uh, if you've sort of in your study of these things, if you've if you've seen um, metal moving, you know, uh, across long distances or from from people to people or community to community in interesting ways. Um, yeah, like, I think because we're the furthest east, like the eastern tribes in the in the northern Athabascan territory territory um the closer you come to the coast the, the stories just become so much more bigger and much more connected to family stories um, whereas in the northwest territories and in my region we're so disconnected from the oral histories of our copper use um, so it gets the, the stories from the yukon and alaska and it's specifically in alaska you actually see the dagger in in, in an exhibit exhibition space and then you start seeing copper uh, a bit less in the Yukon in their exhibition spaces but they do have some daggers there um, and the I believe that you know if you look at that, that one image I had here of the maps um, you can see that this part here is the Great Slave Lake and these are um, traditional trappers trails and hunters trails and you just see the extensive movement of our communities that you know, flow into the Yukon and through that trade. So this is uh, the slavey people's area going into BC. Um, and these stories were collected in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but I think the, the, the long ago stories that you start to hear more in the Yukon and in Alaska were better recorded in the early periods. And so we get more stories of, um, you know, conflict of, um, I've heard some great stories about how people on the coast would, um, use the daggers to um, prove manhood and to uh, um, fight with bears um, and things like that. But they were also really sacred items. So there's never been a dagger that's been found in an archaeological site. The ice patch is really the first one that has ever been found um, in, in the landscape. Mostly uh, a lot of people suspect that it has to do with how sacred these knives are and how um, difficult um, it is to actually to acquire a dagger. So they become quite a, a valuable commodity to people. Um, so in this uh, in this image here, we show like they had exhibited uh, the Northern Athabascan dagger, a dagger in um, Victoria, and then the dagger was like stolen <laughs> from the exhibit site. And it, um, it did find its way back um, to the collection, but um, I mean, there is a, a desire to like, uh, to take these items from, from the museums and from the collection. So it's really rare to see, see them. I know that some families um, keep them and, and don't bring them out and they're very sacred and not talked about to Day in the same way that they maybe used to in the 1950s or even at the turn of the century in the 1900s. So for myself, one of the things like this is the only image that I have the, the Indian boy on on the right is actually wearing a knife on his uh, around his neck. And those were the stories that I kind of heard um, in Yellowknife when I was growing up there that we did have copper, but nobody was quite sure what it looked like. Some people thought it had a curve, um, but there are a lot more stories associated to the daggers um, along the Pacific coast and into this area here that I'm on, on Vancouver Island. 
um, that are still kind of confusing the connection of, of who actually made these knives and which areas they come from. So I honestly believe that we all had a copper history. We all had an awareness and a connection to copper and the communities are still at a place where we're still learning and reconnecting with our relationships to, to the copper and to the daggers. And um, you're starting to see more uh, artists in the Yukon actually refabricate these. Um, there, Brian Walker has done work there for over 20 years and he's inspiring a lot of young um, interior clinket um, copper makers. And there are also, you know, the next generation who are, who are, who are applying this <laughs> artistic practice. And so we're, we're reconnecting. And this is my way of reconnecting with my community and my way of like trying to figure out some of our history that's um, a, a little bit beyond what we understand from pre-residential school um, relationships that we had with the land. So I have a question. I was wondering, the dagger found in around Carcross, would that have been like a Carcross Clinket dagger, or would it have been like a Tagish Athabaskan person's dagger? Um, I think it's really tricky um, to really identify one particular nation today. I think because we operated really differently back in those times, like mm -hmm. we're talking about a thousand years ago, and we didn't have these governance, um, I guess, labels that we use today. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, but what this, what this particular endpoint does is it just validates that we had copper history long before contact, um, and they were finely crafted. Um, they have still a similar shape and design, um, in, in its fabrication. And this is just a, an amazing example, uh, that has been held in, in the landscape in, in, in the ice patches. And there's still potentially more things to be discovered, um, that will bring us closer to understanding the how we use copper um, back in those days and potentially reconnect people with it in my community we have um, stories about a copper woman um, I didn't do a lot of oral history in my research project mostly because of COVID-19 I did my master's during the whole two-year period so I was restricted with how far I could go into the community and so the little bit of stories I did have I decided to separate and really focus on what non-native people have said and written written about us over the last hundred years in relationship to copper and our daggers. Thank you so much, Kachish. I, I don't have a question as much as a statement. Um, I, my father is Lingette from this area, and the oral, tr oral history that I have is that we were rich in copper for the Flingettes in this area in Wrangell. That's, that's what he told me. We were very wealthy because we had lots of copper. Yeah, there was, there's a huge, like I've read a lot of papers that have sharing our, um, at this conference that have been presented about that rich history with the uh, inner, inner uh, the, the Atina, the Atina tribes on the, um, on the Pacific coast that had that relationship with the Clinket and the relationships to Vancouver Island. There is a rich history there um, that has been already really well written and researched in the last, I would say, 30 years. Um, but there's always been very little about my area, the Dene, the the interior eastern Athabascan tribes and so I really wanted to make connections and make that link um, because it is in our name it's in our history and we're just uh, we're just finding our way of reconciling that information and material in in the collection um, there's still a lot of work to do and there's lots of opportunities to really uh, expand that oral history among all of the indigenous groups in in all three territories in the northwest territories Yukon and Alaska and hopefully inspire future to generations to picking up these threads and 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 taking them and moving them forward i think it's interesting because he was not able to tell me where they got the copper from so this is a great a, a, a great idea yeah, I think so. Um, we have some great oral history legends. I think the right team of people and the people who are focused on looking at those aspects of our history um, can really produce some really interesting material. Um, uh, like I said, I, I was curious as I was in my 20s and I discovered this dagger and it came into, came into my space and I just couldn't let it go and I just wanted to know more. And so...
oh, this is what led me to the university and then um, and drawing on that academic and scholarly text to, to dig through because there are a lot of connections um, and interesting uh, links um, to Siberia that, um, that show a relationship coming into the coast, but they don't show the copper going back into Siberia. So it was a one-way street. Uh, they didn't trade back into Siberia. So I found that really interesting. Um, but they've had a, in Eastern Siberia, they have this like, a, there's the Mackenzie Delta and there's a Delta in Siberia as well that has uh, natural sources of tin and copper um, that have a long history of, uh, of smelting technologies. So um, that metal relationship is, is, is there, but it still seems that um, the Athabascan, uh, the Northern Athabascan connection to copper is still, there's still more work that can can be done there and discovering what we know about that history. I think um, I think a lot of sorry a lot of that history probably I would imagine relates to like the inland plinket because we kind of ended up so far inland just to kind of control the trade between the 12 Yukon First Nations right so there would have yeah. been a lot of copper trade there for sure. Yeah. You guys managed all the trails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's good history out there. I've read a lot of material about the inland clinket. Um, but like I said, I, I focus on the northern Athabascan, just really wanting to, to start to start a foundation. We need to start developing our own relationships and connections and look at how we related to each other. Um, I found that the Bloody Falls story was really interesting because it connected our um it connected the Inuit as well into the story and how we how we battled with each other, motivated by our copper economy that was operating in the in the north in the northern territories, and we were all connected and related through copper, and these motivated our relationships. It was, you know, this inspired people to go to the coast and to source out, you know, metal metal tools and such, or even to trade. So there's all all types of um, opportunities to show how how connected we. We were, we were in pre-contact period as Indigenous people in the sub-Arctic. Good chief once again, Jennifer, a big round of applause for Jennifer. <laughs> and Han. Jennifer, thank you so very much for joining us. You're welcome.